This is what we call the Atacama humanoid. First of all, I don't know what it is. Every scientist has looked at it and says, oh my God, it looks like an alien. I just got a report from Chile last night that multiple of these small creatures have been seen live and living in these foothills of the Andes in the Atacama region. We really have a phenomenon of something that is a creature not described in the medical literature or not described in the scientific literature anywhere. It has 10 ribs. No human has ever lived with 10 ribs. It has four skull bones rather than the six major ones we have. This is six inches tall. The Atacama skeleton was found in this area of Chile. Now, this is an area that the native peoples had reported seeing small people, which they called the Gentiles. It's an interesting term they use for them. Uh, for centuries and perhaps millennia. It may be something prosaic, but I don't believe so. And here's why. If you put up the Lachman report, Dr. Ralph Lachman at Stanford University, who's the number one expert in the world on skeletal dysplasias, which means skeletal abnormalities and genetic syndromes, examined, he actually, we went to Barcelona where this little being is stored. We took exact x-rays that he requested from Stanford. He looked at it and he said, well, first of all, there is no form of dwarfism or genetic defect that explains everything it's seen in this being. It has 10 ribs. No human has ever lived with 10 ribs. What he didn't notice, but I will point it out to you, it has four skull bones, rather than the six major ones we have. It's symmetrical. And the epiphyseal plates, if you look at the x-ray, which is the growth plates. You know when you have you know, the growth plates in a kid and they, they hurt their leg? The growth plates and the bone density is that of a six to eight year old. All right, now call me crazy, but I'm just a doctor. But I can tell you, I've taken care of a lot of children that are six and eight year olds. I've never seen one six inches tall. This is six inches, 13 centimeters. What six to eight year old can live to be only six inches tall? Number one. Number two, how did it live? It was found in the driest place on earth, the Atacama Desert in Chile, northern Chile. It is estimated to be in, in many decades and probably hundreds of years old. There was no neonatal intensive care unit in Chile at that time. There may not be now. And even at the best neonatal intensive care unit in the world today, you could not keep this person for lack of a better word, alive. So the question becomes, what is it? The DNA was handed off along with these images to Stanford and to Dr. Nolan in October of 2012. And then it seems everything fell apart. Now, you can read these for yourself, where he's basically saying that the chances this is a, a spontaneous chance of mutation are infinitesimally small. And we had discussions where he said, essentially, we don't know what this is, but the chances it could be a mutation from just a, a singular event in a human embryo are infinitesimal. One month later, a $3.2 million grant award, a Teal Award, was granted to Nolan and his lab from the Department of Defense. By the time he began to start running the genetic tests and workups, it seems that he had been told by someone to say it was a deformed human. And that's what you will read in the New York Times and on CNN and the BBC that came out in March. What you find is that there is an orchestration of a release of information mixed with disinformation coming from what the CIA official calls the Rat Pack that's been running scams on the public for decades. It's very worrisome. And it also means that we are going to have to do this through the alternative media. 
the interests for secrecy are really fall into uh, three broad areas. The biggest became the technological and scientific end of this. Once we retrieved back in the 30s and 40s and 50s several of these extraterrestrial vehicles and began to study them, we combined that knowledge with knowledge we already had because remember we had some people like T. Townsend Brown and the Beefield Brown effect who were studying anti-gravity quite independent of this issue back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. But when their information got combined with studying these spacecraft, they figured out, ah, oh, this is how they're working. And they realized it's the end of oil. It's the end of the need for coal. It's the end of the combustion engine, the internal combustion engine. It's the end of transmission lines for electricity because the energy that these spaceships are using, what people call UFOs, we don't call them, no one in the business calls them UFOs. They are not unidentified and they don't fly. These objects are extracting energy from the fabric of space, okay, around, not outer space, but the fabric of space. And in fact, even the early uh, Lockheed and Northrop experimental spaceships that we have built, and we're talking 1950s and 60s, were called flux liners because they were pulling energy from the quantum flux field, what's called the quantum flux field that's in the space in this room. And every cubic centimeter of space, for example, in this room has enough energy to run the earth for a day. It's a huge amount of energy. And so once this was um, really figured out by the mid 50s, long time ago, they knew that this would be the end of the oil cartels and the international financial petrodollar system and a huge amount of the industrialists would then have to change their whole way of operating. Because think about it, what happens when every village in India or Sub-Saharan Africa can have a device that looks like a generator and it's extracting energy from this quantum flux field, suddenly you have an economic growth uh, all over the world. And this is a wonderful thing. It would be the end of poverty. But it would also be the end of the economic hegemony where Europe and America, with 600 million people, dominate the whole global economy. So this is a huge geopolitical problem. And so the issue isn't about just money. It's about power. Who has the power? How the earth is run? who is running Earth. And then you have another issue, and that is there are people who view the world as they understand it. And in, the, in America, we have a saying, if you wear rose-colored glasses, you see everything in the world is rose-colored. But if you're wearing glasses that are conflict-colored, colored with a sort of paranoid, and militaristic view of the world, you're going to view these visitors as a threat and you're going to respond to them as a threat, even though there's no evidence that they're a threat. I want to be very clear on this. There's no objective evidence that anyone has been harmed by these visitors and there's certainly no evidence that they're a threat to us. There's a lot of evidence, however, that they're concerned about our threat to the peace and the order of space. Why? because our technological capabilities and our weapons have surpassed our social and spiritual development, clearly. And we are at that stage in the evolution of a global civilization where our science and technology has gotten way out there, but our social and spiritual is lagging. And this is that danger zone. And Earth is in this danger zone now. And they know this. These visitors from other civilizations, other planets, know this. So, unfortunately, I think that they have had a great concern about our nuclear facilities. We know this. We have colonels and uh, lieutenant colonels who are Strategic Air Command and the Atomic Energy Commission who have testified at DisclosureProject.org that every single one of our nuclear weapon storage areas have been visited 
by these ET spacecraft because they were obviously concerned. And in uh, the Soviet Union also, in Russia. We have uh, spoken to people with the KGB and, and with their space command. And so it's clear that they have that concern, but that doesn't mean that they're hostile towards Earth. I think they're concerned about human hostility. Remember, uh, this is not particularly good news for you. It's good news for humanity and for the Earth and for the environment. But there's only a few hundred people and corporations who really control the world economy. And this information would change forever their grip on that power. Now, they would still have a lot of money, but it's not about money. You and I think of money, can I afford to put my son or daughter to college or buy a home or what have you. They're viewing it as power, the geopolitical control. So it's a power issue. And this would change geopolitics forever.